Okay, so maybe uh, I'll just quickly um, do sort of a really general introduction um, to to why we're here today and, and to David. So, and I'll turn on, I'll see if I can turn on my camera for this part. It slows down our Wi-Fi a lot here. Um, so back in, um, I would say, I guess it was summer of 2018, uh, Conservancy of Canada and Ducks Unlimited purchased a property uh, in Brighton, Ontario, that um, is a beautiful, uh, it's got co coastal wetland. It has 2.5 kilometers of shoreline on Lake Ontario. Uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous spot. Amazing species there like least bittern and king rail nesting in the marsh. And so um, myself and Erling and Kyle, who are both actually on this call right now from Ducks Unlimited, we went out to do a survey of the shoreline and we were actually looking for Phragmites. We weren't looking for starry stonewort. Um, I didn't even know what starry stonewort was at that point two years ago. And uh, we had, ducks had their boat out and we were trying to um, go right along the, the shoreline where the vegetation was and the boat was just getting stuck everywhere. And Kyle had pulled some of what was getting stuck in the motor out and he said, I think uh, starry stonewort. And so that sort of that's where this began. And then I got in contact with David and um, realized that Presqu'ile Bay, which is where um, the Brighton Wetland property is, was actually the first uh, known location of Starry Stonewort on Lake Ontario. Uh, so this is sort of snow. Um, me getting in touch with lots of other fantastic people through David in Ontario that are also concerned about Starry Stonewort. Uh, and that also led us to today where we were going to talk about some of the um, the ID features and uh, some sampling techniques for Starry Stonewort. Uh, and um, David is the project manager for the Starry Stonewort Collaborative, uh, which is a project with the Finger Lakes uh, PRISM, which I believe is Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And I know right. that everybody on this call, especially the four Megan Quinns, are really excited to uh, learn more. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to you, David. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. That's a great eye. You're, you're well informed. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you for a while here this morning. Um, I will go through this as fast as I can without being too quick because it's going to, we got a lot of material to cover. Um, but I just did this last Tuesday and it went pretty well. Um, so yes, uh, Starry Stonewort, and uh, I'll talk to, well, let me put this up first. I'm going to get ahead of myself already. Here we go. Um, that link, I don't know if Amanda, if you had a chance to circulate that or not. Um, if you're going to write anything down this morning, that should probably be the one thing to write down. Um, and of course, we can email it to you. That's a link I set up to, a, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Box, Box program online. It's a, like many online uh, cloud storage, and I've put uh, at least 10 documents in there uh, for reference. One of the documents has links to other references, including the, uh, the videos I'm gonna show this morning. This actual presentation is up there. Um, so this is the one thing that you, I'm kind of joking, but if you wanna write it down, fine. If not, we'll get it to you, but and I'll go over this later. I'll show you what everything is there. So quickly, uh, we'll go a little bit of the boring background stuff, but probably help explain who I am, what we're doing. Uh, we'll talk about invasive species in general, and my Amanda mentioned, and I'm guessing you folks are pretty well, are pretty well informed about invasive species. So I won't spend a whole lot of time on that. But sometimes we do these presentations, and there's people that are completely new to it. Um, and we'll talk, and then we'll get into the good stuff. Um, we'll talk about the survey and sampling steps that we are are uh, suggesting and promoting, um, including using a, a phone and tablet app called Survey123. Uh, we'll talk about identification of starry stonework, but also some, uh, some other invasives. Um, and I'll talk again more about that. With, while we got you here out, you know, hopefully tossing some rakes, uh, it doesn't hurt to be able to identify a couple other invasives because um, you find them and it's uh, early detection that's critical. Maybe, maybe something can be done about them early. And then we'll have wrap up questions and I have a little uh, Zoom poll, it's four questions I think I'll have you do at the end as well, it just gives us some feedback on what we did. Um, I will stop once or twice for some a couple of brief questions only and then we'll try and do most questions at the end. 
Uh, try and use your chat box if you can for questions. Uh, this isn't a huge group, but it's still we're approaching 20 people, it looks like, and it's just a little easier for Amanda to uh, field questions if they're in the chat box. So a little background, the collaborative. Um, I work at Hobart William Smith Colleges, uh, more specifically the Finger Lakes Institute. Um, and we promote, as it says, environmental research and education. We have a couple labs on site. We're kind of a, we used to say non-curricular department, but last year our director taught a class there. So I guess it's changing a bit, but mostly we're a research uh, and outreach organization run on those different program areas. As Amanda said, within Finger Lakes Institute is the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. It's a mouthful, it's Finger Lakes Prism. Um, I just put that up there because as you look at some of the materials I've supplied for you, you may see that, uh, just so you know what that is. Um, it's a partnership organization, as it says, that we do anything we can and partner with whoever to do what we can to control the spread or the introduction or prevention of invasive species. And there's, we're proud of them. It's a, neat, it's a neat structure. There's eight prisms across New York State, and ours is just one of them. We like to say the best one, but I won't go there. That's, that's just pride. Okay. Uh, the collaborative itself, we are funded uh, through the uh, US EPA Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Thank you to those folks. Um, it's a Great Lakes Basin-wide program, which obviously you know that, that's why you're here this morning. Um, that's a big deal for us. You know, we spread our wings a little bit and went out beyond New York State uh, for this program. Um, and this is kind of our tagline, but the idea is we're going to enhance everybody's, everybody's looking at starry stonewort in other invasives, but starry stonewort primarily to help them do what they do to, uh, to control it, understand it. And we're looking at ecology, outreach efforts, and control techniques. And real quick, control techniques right now, there's a tremendous amount of research going on in that area. Um, all across the Great Lakes Basin, there's experts looking at different control techniques. One of the things we wanted to do when the collaborative started was to collect everybody's best management practices and be the central hub and disperse those, right? Or even maybe look at everything and make our own. Well, after talking to the experts quickly, they looked at me like I was crazy because there are no best management practices for starry stonework. There's no known existing long-term controls for starry which is a little bit frustrating and depressing, but we're gonna keep pushing and hopefully we'll get there sometime. So quickly, a little map, um, you know, again, it's in, this in, in talking to you folks, this is an international project. We're excited about this. Put a little star there roughly where I think you are, um, uh, North Shore of Lake Ontario. It's a, that's, that's the, water, the, water, the you know, watershed or the basin for the Great Lakes. It's big, um, very big. And if you notice in New York State, I can point here. Um, the Great Lakes Basin, uh, which in, in New York State includes part of Ontario and Lake Erie, takes up about a third of the state. So, you know, we're New York based, but we have a big stake in this as well. So, this is you guys here, and this is where we are, Spring Lakes Institute. And zooming on, on that, um, that's where we are. The Finger Lakes, if you haven't been down, please visit. Um, summer's better <laughs> for obvious reasons. But uh, it's a beautiful region. I can't lie. It's uh, the, called the Finger Lakes for a reason. These all look like long skinny fingers. Um, we're here on the shore of Seneca Lake. Cuga Lakes over here, they're both 38 miles long, roughly. So they're, they're quite large, long skinny lakes. I live over here on Owasco, and that one's 11 miles, just to give you some scale. How do we structure the collaborative? Um, I'm down here, my desk is way down at this point here. <laughs> the Finger Lakes Institute does the uh, management and facilitation of the project, essentially. Um, we have an expert panel. Um, we we uh, asked eight, it's varied a little bit, but roughly eight people, experts across the region um, to work with us. And some of these folks have been working specifically with Starry Stonewort for as much as 10 years. Um, so then we tried to have them cover all those people that knew about outreach, knew about ecology, you know, knew about control methods and, and so on and so forth. Um, so they're, they act as advisors to us. They're advisors, sort of like my board, if you will, um, advisors and guidance for the project. 
Then we have the collaborators. Um, collaborators, we have a huge number growing. We have 30 plus of them. Um, Amanda and the uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada, that's, that's the collaborator. You know, there's, there's existing entities that have, have some resources, a lot of knowledge about invasive species. Um, just uh, Tuesday, I worked with this group out of a college in Grace, no, Winona, Lake Winona, I guess, Indiana. But the point is, they're, they're a group, uh, kind of a water institute like we are out of a college. So the collaborators are out there doing research like the experts, panelists, and many of them are just as adept as the expert panelists. It's just, you know, we've got a lot of people, the academics, government, um, NGOs, all kinds of people out there that we keep. I'll ask some questions, but they're, they're our eyes and ears out there. And most importantly, they help reach us out to the citizen scientists and sometimes refer to them as community scientists. Everything from uh, you folks joining us, Ducks Unlimited, to lake associations, to just concerned citizens. And uh, we're really excited to be doing this with you guys right now. This is just the way the model we set up uh, to make it work. Because obviously, a coronavirus or not, you guys are long distance from me. Um, so, you know, doing these things long distance, we had to, we need help out in the field. So we got the collaborators to help uh, come up with folks that are interested in, in joining us in learning how to do these things. So that's it for the structure. That's just a real quick overview. Um, if you want more information, our website um, has got all kinds of information on it. And I can be contacted as well. So I can move right into, in the interest of time, some general information about invasive species. And I'll go quick, because again, I, I think most of you are probably pretty understanding of invasive species. Definition, non-native, the ecosystem, they can cause harm to economic, environmental, and human health. Straight up, you know, that's what it is. There's any number of examples, probably all of us could, you know, identify on all three of those levels. This, I love this, if you haven't seen this, this is a great graphic, particularly for people if you're moving forward, um, if you, you know, kind of move forward and carry the, carry the baton, if you will, and talk to other people that are not from an invasive species, this is a really good chart. You know, over on the far left here, we've got prevention. No species, net, no invasive species, that's where we want to be, right? That's the best place to be. Somewhere between there and the eradication step, we've got, this is when interve intervention is the best time and I threw this in early detection, and that's why we're trying to train as many people as we can at the community level to get out there, throw some rake, do some rake tosses on boots on the ground and start seeing where stuff is. And if, and if something does pop up, they can uh, hopefully, you know, talk to some, some, um, some entity, you know, natural resources organization or, or government or somebody to help figure it out. Um, so this area, when you get to eradication, it's small numbers of populations Sometimes you can get in and clean stuff out and eradicate them. Over here, containment, uh, this is where it gets harder and harder to uh, take care of and it starts to get, eradication's unlikely. Unfortunately, heading up this curve, this is generally when public awareness actually begins. We need public aware of invasives all the way back here. We need them knowing right up front that you can't let this stuff spread. And then this ugly uh, orange red bubble here, this is where Things have taken hold and we're just living with it. Eradication is almost impossible at this stage. And it's more of a management situation, learning how to live with it. Notice over here, as this graph goes up, control costs go up and up and up and up. Up in this level, control costs are very expensive. It's very hard to do. But it's a great, it's a really useful graph. Just real quick, uh, again, you guys know this, invasive species, no natural enemies. They reproduce quickly and easily. They can survive in all kinds of conditions and they mess up the, the, eco, the biodiversity ecosystem, push out the natives, mess with food and habitat. I love this comic just because we have a, a, lot, a, deal, a lot of milfoil and zebra mussels down here. Um, when I do a presentation like this, lake associations love it. So it's just a silly comic, but uh, impacts. I got, got a, just some, again, I show these to uh, um, so people that don't aren't aware, uh, this is a terrestrial Japanese barberry. It's a it's a it's a ornamental sold by um, greenhouses and, and lawn places and whatnot. Out in the woods, it takes off and it just takes over your lower story. Uh, people that don't understand how that can affect them, researchers have figured out when it's like this in, the, in this forest, there's 120-ish ticks per acre. If Barbary's not there, 
there may be only 10 ticks per acre. Um, so it's just a quick example of human impact. Giant hogweed, we have this stuff here, it's really bad. I don't know if you've seen it out your way yet. Another terrestrial, it's a neat looking plant, it's very tall, it goes seven or eight feet tall. But any part of the plant, if you get, if you touch it and get any of the sap on it, it's a phytotoxin. I'm not sure that's the right term. It would cause a rash on your hands or whatever, any skin part, much, much worse than poison ivy. And it's photoreactive. So the more sunlight you're in when you get this stuff, the worse the burn gets. I've heard it likened to chemical burn. It's nasty stuff. Spotted lanternfly, this is an economic one. Um, these are in, infested in areas of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, south of us in New York State. Um, New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, Department of Transportation, a bunch of others are scrambling to do everything they can to keep this out of here because they attack uh, fruit trees and other fruit crops and they, they don't attack the fruit, they attack the stems and I believe suck out the sap and it kills the plant or the tree in big infestations. And, they, and we're pr very proud of our apple crop here. Um, so I take personal offense to this because I like apples and they also attack vineyards and we're very proud of our vineyards and our wineries in uh, the Finger Lakes region. I do like an occasional glass of wine. So we're hoping to keep these things out of here. And then just real quick, our favorite starry stonewort. That's a picture from uh, actually uh, Carol Cole over in the Quartha Lakes region. I think Amanda's spoken to her on the phone. And uh, this is their beautiful waterfront that's now been taken over and, and an example of, again, economic. It's real hard to drag a boat through there, as you know. And if that was a good place to fish and boat, you, you might lose some economic drivers for the community. So this poster, we love this poster. It basically just get the people understand, anybody you know, tell them preventing equals protection and that's money saved. And that means you know, the whole clean, dry, dry, clean, drain, dry thing for boats and trailers and other gear. Uh, same with uh, land-based, you know, get, make sure your, um, uh, your little, uh, what do you call it, ATV is uh, clean of, of, you know, bits of plants and seeds and kinds of things and just keep it from spreading, keeping it out all together. That's what it's all about. So that's that. Um, now we're going to get into the, uh, the real, the fun stuff. You guys know what citizen scientists are. The, you know, it's, it's work undertaken by, scientific work taken under by general public uh, in collaboration or working directly with scientists. And it's so valuable, as you probably know, there's so many things that we do. I work with the local lake association here too, and it's just amazing what we can get done. So the goal of the survey is to learn to identify one to five priority species. Now, we're not going to crack the whip over you folks. Most of you already are good to get a handle of starry stonewort, but we're going to go into detail about starry stonewort, a lot of detail about as much as I can anyway remotely. But we're also going to go over some of these, these other four, Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, hydrilla, and water chestnut. Um, just because we figure if you're throwing a rake out there and you pull it in, let's see what, you, what, what, what you've got on there. And we're not, again, if you're comfortable identifying one, that's fine. If you're identifying one or two or three, that's great too. If you want to dig in and get really into this, we'll help you identify as many invasives as you can. So the protocol, what we set up. Um, we're, we're suggesting you do rake tosses in one to three locations. Again, whatever's easiest for you. If you have access to a dock in front of your home, if you're lucky enough to have a waterfront, you, want to, you can only do one rake toss, that's fine. We're looking to have it done every other week, every other week for the next four months. So we're almost into July here, um, July through October. You can keep going if you want. If it's an open fall and it's not too horrible weather, feel free to keep sampling in November. But the weather gets pretty icky in November. So if you do this every other week for four months, it's eight weeks. If you do the three tosses, that's 24 rake tosses. So you're gonna throw a rake 24 times over four months. Not a huge effort. One thing I didn't put on this slide and should have, and this is very important, um, yes, do the rake tosses in the same locations. Um, why do we do this? Well, it, it keeps some consistency, but you know, over time, if early in July you do a rake toss and there's no starry stonewort, fine, you mark it down, there's no starry stonewort. But 
down the road in the end of July, early August, and now you're pulling up starry stonewort, well, that might mean that an existing bed is spread or, or, it's, or um, it's just, it's located itself through a fragment or something in a new location. So that's all good information. If you're doing this from a kayak, um, we're not asking you to go crazy with anchors and GPS units to get exactly the same location, just do the best you can. I've been out there on windy days in kayaks doing rate tosses and it's kind of a chore, but it's fun too. But so, so if, you do, if you do up to three locations, just get them as close as you can to the same spot. Don't worry about it. We urge everybody to go in small groups, two counts as a group just for a safety. We're talking about being on the water. We like to promote good water safety. And also if you're in a group of people, um, and you really get into this and you, you get to collect a bunch of different um, uh, different types of invasives or, <clears throat> excuse me, or natives on uh, your rake toss, you can kind of bat it around discussing what they are as you're learning how to do this with a guide or whatever. And it, it helps build uh, a depth of knowledge in your organization as well. <clears throat> Bring this in, you look at it, record what you find. Okay, and again, we're gonna, I'm gonna walk you through the survey one, two, three application. We don't want to exclude anybody. We strongly suggest it, but if you're really not comfortable using a phone or tablet app, we do have paper forms available um, you can fill out. Also asking you for, for our grants, we're asking you to send us 10% of the samples you collect of starry stonewort. Um, so it's just a check. It's just to make sure that everybody's identifying things correctly. That's not very difficult either. If you do 24 rake tosses, doing Basic math, not my strong suit, but that's 2.4 rake tosses. So if you do all you know, 24 rake tosses over eight weeks, you're gonna send us two samples. And I'll explain how to do that. That's pretty easy. And then I'm gonna try and check when everybody gets organized and starts doing this. Um, again, you're doing this little protocol every other week. I'm gonna try and check in with you via email. I like to say I'd put out some kind of cool newsletter every other week. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen or not, but I'll try and keep you up to date on what's going on and um, you guys can keep me up to date on what you're doing and so on. And we're trying, so we're trying to keep it simple. Again, one to three rake tosses every other week is not real hard. Um, record what you find and uh, send us 10% of the samples. If you only do one rake toss a week, that's one sample a season or something. We just want to make sure, you know, everybody's identifying what they can. You're also gonna be taking pictures with the app. Uh, so please send us those too and we'll talk about that. So I am going to, if all, all goes well, uh, play a video right here of a woman from her office. Unfortunately, she just left our group and we miss her, Patty, but she's, uh, she's gonna describe how to do a rake toss. Um, quickly, these pictures, uh, again, probably not unfamiliar to you, but I do wanna point out Sometimes, you know, if you're in a bed of uh, starry stonework that raked, this is me, um, the solid, solid uh, glob of starry. Here's similar, maybe a little smaller, but sometimes you only get this much. This is interesting because it looks like there's one little piece of maybe uh, eelgrass in here. Um, but so most of you did a toss, you get very little. And that's important down the road. I'll explain it to you. So hang in there. We can, if this works. Uh, this one. Today we're at beautiful Honey Oil Lake in the Finger Lakes at the New York State Boat Launch, and we're going to talk about how to do a rake toss. So first you're going to need two rakes. You can bind them together side by side with a couple of zip ties. Connect a carabiner to the end and you connect a rope to that carabiner. And that rope is gonna be 100 feet long and it's gonna be in increments of foot between each, you're gonna mark off each foot long section of that rope. So when you do throw the rake uh -oh. Hang on. into the water, you will be Sorry. able to judge just how deep it is. When you throw the rake into the water, you wanna make sure you secure the end because you don't want it to go in the water and not be able to retrieve the rake. So you pull it out and you look at all of the plants that you have on the rake and you separate them into piles. Here I'm separating them into piles by species to see what I have present in the lake. And there's some maybe Chinese mystery snails.
This is some Elodea. And that, that specimen there looks very bushy. But then we have another specimen of Elodea. The same plant just looks very different. So plants can look very different depending on where they are in their growth cycle. And then we have this one here, and this one is the same plant as well, only it's on the verge of dying, so it looks very different. We have some coontail, and that looks very different, that's very brown. And then you'll see there's some coontail that's very, very green and very fresh, and then some of it is much darker. So when looking at plant communities, you have to remember that one plant can look very different. It's a piece of pondweed there. Many different types of pondweed. Oh, we've got some eelgrass there up in the left-hand corner, which is a very good source of food for fish. So you always take a white bin with you and you put some water in it. And right now there's some coontail in the pail. So you take a piece off and you set it in the water. So when an aquatic plant is floating in the water, it will spread apart so you can really look at it if you need to ID it. So a lot of times you'll put a coin next to it for size comparison. So if you want to send a picture to someone to help you ID that plant, they will have an idea of how big those leaf leaflets are. So here's just another look at all of the plants. So I believe there's we pulled seven plants from that one rake toss. There's seven plants that we got out of that sample. And uh, sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less, but you can see the different, the different ways that plants look. So now we've got another sample in the bin and that's Eurasian water milfoil, which is an invasive. And you see how I'm spreading it out in the water. I have the coin there for size comparison. And you can see that it has a blunt edge on the tip. It's got a little red tip. Uh, the stem is red. Those are some ID factors and when you're trying to ID aquatic plants. So thank you for watching. Anybody can make a rake or a rake toss. Uh, take a walk down to the end of your dock and drop it in and see what you find. If you need help ID, you could always reach out to your local prism, in this case, Finger Lakes Prism, and we could certainly help you ID some, some plants if you send us photographs. All right, that's a really good uh, explanation of doing rake tosses and how to identify plants. Again, you know, uh, we're gonna show you and, and give you resources to identify one to five or even more if you want. Um, if you want, just want to focus on one or two, that's great. Um, one thing, a couple things real quick. Um, I don't know, I sent up, uh, Amanda, I, I think I sent five kits up for you folks to share to get, get you started. We included rakes. Um, I don't think the ropes are, are um, already um, marked off in one foot sections. If you do that, use tape. Uh, we used to use zip ties and then cut them off, but zip ties get really sharp and they tear up your hands when you're tossing these things in the water and start bringing them back. So if you mark your ropes, uh, use some kind of waterproof tape. I also don't know if we included 100 feet of rope, um, but they're, they're plenty long enough to do a decent, uh, a decent rake toss. Just as she said, make sure you hold on to the end. I tend to stand on the end and hold on to it so we don't lose the rake. So, you collected that, you've done your rake toss, you're pulling, what, let's look at what you have. And so now you have to record the information. So survey one, two, three, I mentioned, it's a free app for smartphones and tablets. <clears throat> we developed a survey form for this project specifically. Why are we using it? It's really, when you get using it, it's very easy and efficient way to record starry storm locations or other invasive species and sample information. Um, as soon as you, Either uh, do it right there if you've got signal and want, don't mind using data or wait till your Wi-Fi, it uploads almost immediately. And then I can see what uh, work you've done, what you've collected, and then we can export it to a spreadsheet or whatever. Um, we have a map, this is kind of, we're still trying this, but there's a map on the website that shows sampling locations. So 
when you do a, a sample um, and then you upload it, there, you, within minutes, hopefully, there'll be a little point on the map, and I'll show that to you, of where you were. It doesn't necessarily say there's star stone right there, but it just shows you where you sampled. And so it'll start to see a, a general picture of where everybody's doing work out there. And then ultimately, we upload it to uh, the USGS uh, Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Group. Uh, I've talked to them by email a couple of times. They're very helpful. I don't want to say anything bad. They aren't really quick about posting stuff, but it gets up there eventually. And then in New York State, we have this, a very uh, well-established IMAP invasives to New York, Pennsylvania. I think it's in one of the Western Canadian provinces too, but it's, it won't really affect you. So, And then also, um, we're going to upload it here, but if, if, uh, if you folks want the data yourselves, we'll certainly give it to you. So very briefly, um, again, this was, I showed this right at the beginning, at this location on, on, in the cloud, there's, this is the number five document, and it's a brief page and a half, two pages I wrote about how to use survey one, two, three. We're going to go through the whole thing, so it's, it's a lot of redundancy. But in that, um, in, the, in that little description, there is a, a kind of cryptic little web address, a URL, and you open that from your phone or your tablet, and it'll walk you through step by step of in downloading and starting the, and installing the app, and then how to run it with the with the, uh, the form we developed. It, it's very easy to use. We've we've had a number of people try it, and hardly ever have we had an issue. So, here we go again. Okay, this is this is kind of the developer view I see on the computer, but in, the, in this case, it's virtually identical to what you'd see on a phone or a tablet. And personally, I don't know what it is, but when I look at it on a phone and a tablet, I think it's even clearer, it's easy to understand. So again, you've done your rake toss, you're looking at stuff, you go in, you open this up, and you put in your, your initials, organizational name. I'm just gonna put FLI, but please put in the full name for me so I know what we're looking at. This part's pretty important. Um, click on the map. Okay, now you need GPS access. Most phones and tablets already have GPS access, access um, running. And if they don't, I'll show you the next step how to get around that. Uh, this is where I live. It's already found where I'm at. I'm gonna zoom in on the town park here, one of the parks we have in town. I suggest that you do this. See, it had found me already, but please zoom in to a, as close as you can, you feel as accurate as possible, because it'll give us more accurate locations of where you're finding, where you're, where you're doing your rake toss. So we'll pretend this is a lake. That's fine, I like that. Lower right-hand corner is a check mark. Click that, and that's all you have to do. And now the system's logged in your location. If you don't have GPS ready on your, on your phone and it says this in that instruction sheet, or if you want to, you can get use GPS from another source, either another app, uh, Google Maps, you can drop a point, um, you, you know, a handheld GPS you like, you can say enter coordinates manually, you can say yes, and you can enter, enter them in. If you did this with a map, which is much easier and probably more fun, uh, just say skip and move on. That's all there is to it. Water body name, whatever it's called. Um, water depth, that's an estimate. If you, if you mark off your rope on your rake in one foot increments, you can use that. Generally, you're gonna be in shallow water. Um, so I'll, I'll just say four feet, I don't know. But you can do feet or meters, whichever you're comfortable with. Um, and then this is where you start identifying things. Now, most cases, you're gonna be doing a rake toss. <clears throat> we included this over here. Um, for example, if you're walking along the shore, maybe you've got a couple different locations on shoreline and you suddenly see a, not your normal location that you would toss a rake, but you see visually a glob of a starry stone or, <clears throat> or something else in the shoreline that's washed up, you notice it's growing. You do a visual survey and say, okay, you click, you click this button, all right? And then I know you didn't toss your ache, you just visually, and then you pick what you've seen, okay? They're alphabetical, starry stone works down here. The red ones are invasives, the blues are, are natives. Again, as many as you feel comfortable learning how to do, uh, but we like to expose people to this to see if they can identify more. Some people really get into it and love to do it. Others just, just want to get it done and see where the starry stone is. 
So again, most people are, are gonna do this though, the rate toss. A little more involved, you do the rake toss, and we're gonna ask you to describe the density or the amount on the rake when you pull it in, okay? We have submerged, so that's underwater, right? And floating. Most of the time, doing rake toss, it's gonna to be submerged. Okay, zero equals no plants. A trace is a handful of plants, sparse, two handfuls, medium is an armful and then dense is the covered rake and as the picture i saw showed you earlier and i have some others sometimes i've been in a kayak and you pull up this rake it's like you barely pull the thing in which is unfortunate it means you hit a huge bed of starry stonework or something you pull it in that's dense it's an estimate do your best right floating is the same thing um it's just no plants arm and usually this is going to be um uh, native um, lily, lilies or unfortunately if you have water chestnut maybe water chestnut or something like that you're probably not going to do a lot of these um, but you might so if you hit anything except zero if you, zero nothing happens okay if you, you can't collect any of these other ones you bring up just a little tiny bit um, or a lot you're going to get a similar list i showed you under under visual inspection um, your submerged species, okay? The red are invasives, the blue are natives. You pick, identify as best you can what you've got on that rake. The dominant species, if you can see the, the, the bed, a lot of times, and I know you guys have done this, look over the side and there's this huge thick bed of, of starry stone or something else. Put it in there, choose what you can, do your best of identifying what the dominant species is. If you don't know, just leave it blank, it's okay. Um, so let's see, we do eelgrass, let's say we had starry stonework and a little eelgrass mixed in, okay? And there's only a little tiny bit, not sure, let's say, uh, uh, let's say, thankfully, let's pondweed, let's say this looks like there's a bunch of pondweed that's dominant, and you pull up these two. And that's it, you can do the same thing for um, floating, except floating is many, just many fewer species, okay? With the dominant floating species, and then what you pull up in your rake. Um, sample collected. This is, again, when I ask you to send in, remember I said we, we ask you to send in 10% of your samples, we need you to say yes here. It's called a voucher sample. When you do that, when you collect a separate sample for later identification or study or research, and uh, you click voucher. If you're getting really into this and you say, this is cool, but I don't know what it is, and you want to send in a, another sample, go ahead, click other as well, um, or instead of, okay, you can do both. But the key thing here is name, date, location, and collection, okay? So, let's so do a voucher, put initials, it's the, what is it, 662620. Six, um, it's probably sample type, meaning it's a voucher sample. Okay, or if you don't, if you're just really into it, you click the unknown, you say unknown, or whatever, or ID, whatever it is, just to tell me I know, know what we're looking at. Voucher, and it's probably only one you've done, unless you really, again, really into it, want to send me samples, it's fine. And that's it, okay? If you don't do the voucher, that rig toss, you just leave it all blank, okay? You just don't even bother with it. And then notes, you can put notes about anything. You can say, uh, you know, really windy, break, toss, very, um, I don't know, <laughs> very generic if you couldn't find exactly you're, you're being thrown around in a, in a kayak or something, but whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Very approximate, okay? So you put notes, don't have to, love to hear what you're doing, and then photos. I'm not gonna do it here, because again, this is not the app on a phone. If you click the camera, please take pictures of what you bring in. But even though you've described the density of it, what you think you have, regardless if you're doing a sample for voucher or not, take a picture of it. This should uh, activate the, the camera app on your device. Take a picture. And you want to do another one, hit the plus sign, and take as many pictures as you want. And they will be logged in and also sent to us along with this form. When you're done, hit the check mark in the lower right and it'll walk you through if you want to submit the data now or later that's it's very straightforward that's kind of written up in that little sheet i did so that's it it's uh, not that much here you just fill in the blanks 
you know, I'll show you what you, how much you got, what you think you got as best you can, and move on to the next one. You're going to do this for every rake toss you do or every, every visual inspection you do. And then this is just the screen captures. This sort of looks like on a phone. Again, it's the same thing. It's just I, in some ways, for some reason, I think it's just easier to read on the phone. Quickly, that's the uh, front page, the home page of the web website. If you can see this, this isn't a very good graphic. Uh, this is this is that live, quote unquote, live map. This is from last year. We ran a pilot in this state, and uh, our friends up in the Quartha Rakes region and um, uh, Lake Simcoe area, uh, they they ran some. So those are not necessarily where Starry Stoner is, but points where they took samples. And it, so if you guys get into this, we'll start to see points over here in your area. Again, just repeat on the voucher, okay? Before you tag the sample, look at it, take some photos, which you can do through the app, um, and make sure the image is clear so you know what you've got. With a Sharpie, we gave you a you know a little starty pack of like three bags and a Sharpie, I think, in the kits we sent up. Write the same information that you put in, I just showed you on the form, on, on the uh, survey one, two, three. Date, location, your name, and what you think it is. Take your best shot, you know, if, you think, if you're wrong, it doesn't matter, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're really confident Starry Stormwort and it's not, we'll be talking with you <laughs> to keep you straight on what is Starry Stormwort, what is it. Put a little tiny bit of water in or maybe a, a white paper towel or napkin, seal it up really well, and then put it in the refrigerator or in a cooler with ice as soon as possible. Um, don't freeze it, but keep it cool and then seal it up well and send it to me. Um, there's, there's a form I'll go over at the end of my, my address. Um, just, and, and then a good idea, let me know you sent it, you send me an email um, and seal it like two or three times. I've sent like a bunch of samples to people and what I do is I put them in bags like this and I put the whole thing in like a, a trash bag and seal that up and then put it in a box. In this case, you can send one or two, you know, just sealed up really well, like two bags or something, and then put it in a padded envelope and send it. It should be fine. You just don't want it leaking all over the mail and things. Um, so that's that. Any questions? I can stop for a minute for questions on the basic survey protocol, which is broken down into two basic things. Get out there, throw your rake, see what you have. I guess it's three things. Throw your rake, see what you've got, and... Uh, record it in survey one, two, three, or again, we don't want to exclude anybody. If you're more comfortable, you can use paper, paper forms. Any, I'll take one or two questions just for time. I don't want to slow down. David, and I did have one question. So some of our, um, at least for, on, for NCC, some of our properties are um, quite remote, so we might not be able to make it there every other week. Is there still value in submitting this data if we can't do it every other week? That's fine. Um, just uh, we can uh, talk offline or exchange emails if you know if you if you come up with some kind of a schedule. Uh, just let me know what it is, look, and then yes, when as soon as often as you can get out, then that's fine. You know that's that's good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and have you ever had? Have you had people send like these samples to you across the border before? So is that going, is that going to cause any problems? You know, that's a good question. I have not. I okay. don't know what will happen there. Okay. Uh, if it's sealed up in an envelope, nobody's going to know what it is. You know, a padded envelope, padded mailing envelope. Yeah. Um, boy, I don't know. Uh, that, you brought up a really good question I should check on because I don't want to okay. cause, if it's illegal to do so, right. clearly we don't want to be doing this. Um, right. You know, thank, <laughs> thank you for that. That's a very good question. Yeah, no, no problem. I just wasn't sure if, you know, um, sending like live plant specimens, which technically, you know, could spread just via fragments would be okay or not. So, and if it's not, we could just do like, you know, high quality photos or something, I guess. But um, yeah, as, as I said, we need photos fine. anyway. And, you know, yeah. if that's all we can do. It's all we can do. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I can, if it worst case, we can. I'll write up a little paragraph for the uh, the grant people, the EPA, say, listen, <laughs> we right. can't put the password. <laughs> Thank okay. you for bringing that up. That's a great yeah. point. I never thought of.
Oh, and there's a just a comment here from yep. uh, some comments from Kyle and Eric. So um, Kyle said, if I recall correctly, you need a phytosanitary permit from CFIA to export plant samples to the U.S. And Eric said, yeah, there are strict protocols for shipping invasive species across the border. So uh, yeah, I de we'll definitely have to look into that or come up with things. Okay, yeah, uh, I don't know even what that is, what you just said. <laughs> Sounds pretty <laughs> important. Um, that, that's a federal thing, right? I would assume. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, boy, uh, yeah. So look into it if you can. Uh, don't okay. I don't want you guys jump through too many hoops. If it's too much of a hassle, uh, okay. You know, let's don't don't bother. I mean, if it's uh, just a simple paper piece of you know paperwork, a quick form to fill out, that's one thing. But if it's this major issue, then I don't want to put you guys through that. And it's not that important. Um, and I will, you know, I'll, I'll talk to our folks at EPA and say, listen, <laughs> it's <laughs> not happening. You know. Right, so, sure. That's a great that's point, great. though. This is, you know, that's why I'm excited about this this project taking international, you know, flavor because it's uh, even shipping those that stuff to you was pretty interesting. Finding out how to do that. So. Yeah, even on my end, receiving it was interesting too. So yeah, I hope it wasn't too much of a hassle. But no, no, all good. So okay. Any other that, questions? Yeah. That's it from the chat box. But if anybody wants to ask anything, feel free to chime in. Or put the chat during during it, and uh, Amanda can make a note of it, or whatever we do it later. So I'm going to get into identification. Um, identification takes practice, pure and simple. And doing this long distance is not doing us any favors as far as really learning how to identify things. I'll do my best. I've got a bunch of slides, um, and I've got as I said, I'm going to go over at the end. We've got we've supplied you as many resources as we can. We included an ID book we we developed in house. We're pretty proud of. Um, and that's also online. So if you don't have the ID book and you just want to print out a couple pages, you can go and just print out the couple pages you need from that, or you can share share what you've got in those five kits. So uh, I urge you to look at fact sheets. I've collected fact sheets for, for several states, um, and they're all up on this on the same place in the box online storage. Um, so I'll show you what I can show you. And then again, you know, be diligent and just kind of learn how to do it. It takes some practice. Fortunately, these five we're talking about, most of them are fairly easy to identify, including Starry. So we're gonna just jump into it here. Okay, macrophyte, you may or may not know this. Uh, macrophyte is any plant large enough to be seen in the naked eye um, growing in or around water. And I've been told by our experts that that includes Starry stonewort. Because as you probably know, we're going to get into, starry stonewort is a macroalgae. It's not a vascular plant, but it's still considered a macrophyte in a greater, a much greater family. These are some references. I'm not going to go over in detail. Um, uh, these are favorites of our, our in-house expert. Um, this, this presentation is also available in that storage, so you can go through and look at the slide if you want. Uh, this one is two volume set she loves because it's a big, easy, nicely drawn line drawings of plants. Um, through the looking glass, you may have seen it's very popular with a lot of people for identifying aquatics. This is ours that we sent up a couple copies of. And this one from Maine is apparently, I honestly haven't seen it yet, but it's supposed to be a very good book. It was published by some folks up in Maine. Um, so there's just some, some book level references you can look at. Getting into some basics of how to identify aquatics. Okay, these are some basic things you're going to think about all the time. Growth habit. Is it emergent? In other words, does it grow up through the water and emerges out into you know, the, the air, if you will, like a, like a cattail does? Um, is it floating or free floating? You're floating like a, um, a lily pad or um, a duckweed or something like that? Or is it submersed? Okay, there's some basics. Just submersed is like starry stonework or anything. It grows off the bottom. Identifying characteristics. <clears throat> I'm just going to go basically leaves. Leaves are really important, particularly when you're learning. Uh, trust me, I'm still on the learning curve myself. Uh, leaves are a big player identifying things. Stems, roots. Uh, is it a rhizome or a stem? Uh, starry stonewort does, sorry, is it a rhizome or a root? Starry stonewort's, again, a macroalgae. It has rhizomes. It does not have roots. These things affix it to the bottom, but they don't act like roots. Take uptake of uh, nutrients and things like other plants. Flowers and seeds and fruits will go over just a little bit. Um, but leaves are a key thing. 
this was diagram was done by Kate in our office. I think she said she did this by hand. She's amazing. She's really into this stuff and very good at it. Leaf shape, basics. Uh, curly leaf pondweed sort of looks like this, right? There's wavy margins around the edge, very blunt. Starry stonewort right here, long, thin leaves look like, starry stonewort doesn't, if you've seen it, it doesn't even look like it has leaves. It has little branches, but it's still considered leaves. Um, serrated, a serrated margin, they call it, on the edge of a leaf. This is really important. We'll get into it later to identify hydrilla. Um, but serrated leaves are important. And now there's all these different shapes. There's these compound leaves. Sometimes these are just little tiny thin threads, but they come as one leaf with these little things coming off of it, almost like a, a, almost like a bird's feather or something. Different shapes. Leaf arrangement is really critical in my mind is learning this. You could alternate. There's like a, she did like a schematic here. And this is, notice this stuff's waving around the water. You can look carefully where it attaches. See, it attaches alternately up and down the stem. Similarly here, these are opposite. Uh, again, waving in the water, it looks a little hard, but see where it attaches, they attach at the same point. Okay, so that's what that's about. In a world, world means there's leaves around the stem. And this is pretty important in a lot of, a lot of uh, plants, both native and inv in invasives. It's how many in the world around the plant are a major identification tool. Stems, uh, stems vary. I point here mostly for us, because I can talk about this later, but uh, macroalgaes like starry stonewort and native cara species, you squeeze a stem, it pops because it's not technically a stem. We'll get into that, but again, it's a macroalgae. They actually pop a little bit. Um, stems of like any other basic water vascular plant don't pop. And they, the stems vary dramatically. You know, sometimes this, this is probably, might be a kind of uh, native pondweed or eelgrass. I'm honestly not sure, but the stem is long, thin, and grass-like. Roots, if you're really getting into this stuff, you can start identifying things by roots, the root structure, how many roots are coming out of each floating, whatever it is. This is tiny, it looks like some kind of duckweed. But again, you know, it's important, starry stonewort, uh, they look like little clear, thin, you know, like uh, fishing line roots, but they're not roots, they're rhizoids. And sometimes roots have, have tubers on them, which I'll get to in a sec. Flowers, if it's not like a lily pad, a big, beautiful flower, flowers can be very small and hard to find even. Again, if you're really getting identifying, identifying, identification of these plants, aquatics, uh, sometimes the, if the flowers are available and blooming at the time, they help to identify things. Seeds and fruits, okay. Over here, this is on the root, and this is a tuber. It's like a little mini potato, um, but for hydrilla, which is a really bad invasive, if it gets up old, this is how they, they spread. They spread these tubers out under the sediment. Um, this is water chestnut seed. I don't know if you have water chestnut where you are. I'm going to talk about it later again, but uh, these things are really sharp. These four points, you don't ever want to step on one. Um, they're also extremely hard. I understand they can live in the sediment for up to years and still be viable, which is a problem. And then other things, and there's a video I'm going to show where he talks about these little fruiting things. So it's these and fruits as well if you really get into this. Okay, I'm going to talk about starry stonework specific, both identification, just a little bit of background about it. Um, uh, okay. Here, here it is, this picture you might have seen, this is from Paul Skowinski in Wisconsin. He's an expert, one of our experts, helps us out a lot. Um, it's very long, thin, you've got like five to seven, here's one of the whorls, you get five to seven of these quote unquote leaves, they look like stems, but leaves around each node, down here, down here. Sometimes they branch off these little branchlets up here. This is a nickel for size. This is, uh, those are my dirty fingernails, which will be famous someday from this picture. These are, this is a, a, a bulb bill. They're little reproductive structures. There's more pictures coming. They are, crit they are a key thing. If you see these, it's starry stonewort. They're the little star-shaped white things often in the sediment, but also they come up when you do pull it up in a rake sometimes. And there's an underwater picture from Scott Brown from Michigan. He gave it to us of a big starry stonewort bed. It's an aquatic macroalgae, as I said. As I said, they've come from Europe and Asia. Um, they, some 1978, the dates keep changing, but mid to late 70s, it was, came in the St. Lawrence River. 
um, unfortunately, and then spread into the Great Lakes Basin. Impacts, I'm just gonna go through this quick, um, just like any invasive. Rapid aggressive growth, growth uh, the, in, the, in the starry snowworms case, probably ruined the spawning areas for fish. The effect on water quality is unknown. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of studies being going on there. Um, they're replacing native species. Human impacts, you know, you can't get through the waterway, you can't fish in it, so that means potential economic um, problems. This one's key. What do we know about starry stonewort? And the answer is there's a lot we do not know about starry stonewort compared to many other invasives. Um, again, I talk with the experts fairly often through the Great Lakes Basin, and uh, everybody's learning stuff. There's great research going on, um, but with, there's, there's still a lot we don't know about it, uh, which is which is a, uh, a challenge. It makes it makes it hard to to control this thing. Um, water quality is very interesting. Um, Brian Ginn from the Lake Simcoe Recreation what's it, Recreational Area, whatever they call themselves up there, he's a limnologist with them. Um, he's looking at the potential that uh, Star Storm is a phosphorus sink. In other words, it uptakes lots of phosphorus. And what does that mean? He doesn't know. He just has some preliminary data looking at that. But that's an interesting question. In Europe, where Star Storm is from, they actually protect it. It's rare and it's a protected species. And some of the protect it because they think it cleans the water. What does that mean? I don't know. There's a lot of research. Something very, very different about our water here that's making it grow like crazy. Current extent through the Great Lakes Basin, it's everywhere. Started up in here, right? Great in the um, St. Lawrence River and spread into the Great Lakes. I believe it's spreading Great Lakes and actually back again into New York State. Um, but it's spreading and this probably doesn't show anywhere near all the locations it really is. Uh, a few slides on identification. Um, we've talked about a lot. This is some raw pictures people took in the field. Uh, long skinny stems. It's anchored by the rhizoids. In that right-hand corner, there's a picture of a penny um, with a bunch of uh, bulbils on it, all connected with what looks like thin, clear uh, fishing line. And that's the rhizoids with the, starry, the stars on it. Um, again, if you find the stars, your identification is done for you. It's, it's starry stonework. Um, it is, there are other starwort, starwort, Star Wars Stone Wars, sorry, um, natives, uh, but again, they don't have the, the star-shaped bull bills to help identify it. Um, this is native. There's there's various Kara species. Okay, a Kara is a big family that includes the Star Wars, I believe. Um, there are if you find something that looks like this and it's also Kara. Kara are also macroalgae. If you pop the carrot stem, you may smell like a garlicky or even a, a, a skunk or musky smell. And that's commonly called muskgrass. Um, so if you pull it up and say, what is this? You squeeze it, if it smells, it's not starry stonewort. It's probably a, a um, common native muskgrass. So it's another really easy identifying thing. You know, they're, you know, squeezing the stuff and smelling it. it might look funny, but it works really well. It's not an overpowering smell, but it is, it is identifiable. It's just some more pictures. There's a really tight, beautiful look, close up picture of a, a bull bill looks like a starry stonewort. Um, they have five to seven lobes on it, which somehow match the uh, five to seven um, around the world. So I don't know if you've seen this picture, but again, here's those leaves, which again, they look like stems or branches, but they're five to seven of them around these node points, okay? Over here, it's a little more elevated, like it's floating in the water, but you can still see these, these node points, okay? And this is what it looks like on water. It's very uh, long, stick-like, stemmy-like, if you've seen it. Just some more pictures of masses of it. This is a rake I barely pull out of the water, so this would be a dense rakeful. You can't even see the rake, uh, that's a lot. The, this, I took these, this picture, it's just a, a bed. Um, you can see from, so, so in that form, uh, this would be the dominant species, right? The starry stone right here. Even under, it's going underneath the lilies over here. The lilies getting thinner because they, they have no place to put roots down. Uh, this is a harvester load of it from a local lake association here. 
This picture I love, this again, this again came from Carol Cole over in Corinth, the Lakes region. It's a wonderful picture of, she's holding a, uh, a bull bill and there's a long line of this clear uh, rhizoid. rhizoid. Um, and she calls it, looks like rice noodles. This is a wonderful identification picture, but this is a perfect example of what it looks like. So I'm gonna give you some more, I'm gonna run, um, I hope another video, and this is by again Paul Skowinski in Wisconsin. It's an excellent short video on how to identify starry stormwort and some of its lookalikes, which is critical. Um, you, you'll you have access to these videos. You can go back and look at this again. Um, look at he's done a little smiley and frown faces. If it's native, it's a smiley face and frowning if it's a invasive, um, which helps a little bit. Um, so I'm going to try and run this. Starry stonewort is a species of macroalgae related to many native species in Wisconsin. This species can be challenging to identify, but learning a few important features will help you distinguish starry stonewort from its relatives. These algae have a simple body plan consisting of a main axis, which you could consider the stem. For simplicity's sake, we will just use the word stem in this video. Around the stem are whorls of branchlets, much like the whorls of leaves you would see on other aquatic plants. A key feature of starry stonewort, and probably the easiest to look for, is the presence of star-shaped ball bills. These are produced on clear threads in the sediment, which look like fishing line. A small number of native species will produce ball bills too, but these are generally round like tiny snowballs. Starry stonewort ball bills have many points or lobes. Starry stonewort is very large compared to most other macroalgae in our region. Notice the size of these native species compared to the nickel in each photograph. Then look at the starry stonewort. It is several times larger in diameter than most of our native species. Starry stonewort produces small orange balls along its branchlets. These are the male reproductive structures called antheridia. So far, only male starry stonewort has been observed in North America. This means that there is no sexual reproduction occurring, and therefore no viable seeds are being produced. Without females present, starry stonewort can only spread by bulbils and fragments of itself. Starry stonewort is likely to be confused with several native species. The most commonly confused species are the muskgrasses, also called cara. However, all of the common cara species have long cells running up and down the stem, creating a rough or textured feel. The stem of starry stonewort is smooth. Species of nitella can also look very similar to starry stonewort. The branchlets of nitella always fork at the ends, producing two or more equal length parts. The branchlets of starry stonewort may appear to fork, but what you see is actually a long bract coming out of the branchlet. Since these bracts are often only on the upper branchlets, you can look further down the stem where the branchlets don't have any forks or bracts. When starry stonewort is removed from the water, its stiff branchlets tend to remain in the same position. Species of nitella tend to be very relaxed and droopy when they are out of water. Sago pondweed is a common native species that can look somewhat like starry stonewort. However, notice that its leaves alternate left and right on the stem rather than being in whorls. It also produces many large seeds on long stalks above the plant, which starry stonewort would never do. Horned pondweed has opposite or whorled leaves, but will never produce ball bills, and the leaves are very weak and delicate. It produces many clusters of four banana-shaped seeds along the stem, which it typically holds throughout most of the growing season. Remember, without females present, starry stonework can only spread by ball bills and fragments of itself. Boat trailers, anchors, and other recreational equipment are the most likely vectors for spreading starry stonework. Monitoring boat landings is a smart strategy for detecting an introduction of starry stonewort and slowing its spread. For help identifying starry stonewort and other aquatic plants of your lake, check out the field guides and other helpful resources at the UW Extension Lakes online bookstore. Okay, again, an excellent 
Um, oops. It's an excellent video he did. It's, um, and again, you'll have access to this. Um, he's a great guy. He's, he's he actually wrote his own book. He went out for like a I don't know a year in a kayak and then wrote his own book on Upper Midwest uh, aquatics of all kinds. So we'll go through a few more um, natives and um, invasives. He just mentioned this one, the muskrat. Um, again, it's you know it. When you pop the cells, like I said, or the stem, um, it smells. It smells like garlic or skunk-like odor. You can smell it. Um, it's you know rough textured compared to the the. Uh, it says crusty here. It's kind of interesting, but rough texture compared to starry stonewort. Uh, so that's that's a common one. It's it does look quite a bit different. You know, it's kind of dense. There's all these little branchlets it has and things. Pondweed, he talked about that as well. Uh, it's just more, I, I call this more feathery. You know, it looks more like a feather or fan, as it says here. These, it often has these little seed things and these shoots coming up. Uh, it's, um, it's only a meter long. Uh, Starry Stonework gets up to um, keepers. They've, it's good eight, 10 feet now. Um, three, four, five meters long, sometimes longer. Um, so it's quite much smaller. Get different invasive. Okay, get off away from the starry stone and its kin or, or its lookalike, it shouldn't be kin. Curly leaf pondweed um, is quite easy to identify, um, but it grows up off the bottom. It's a submerged and then it hits the surface like this and kind of lays across the surface. I don't know if it keeps growing across the surface, but it lays up like this in this big mat. Again, like any invasive, hard to get through, but it's got those, those wavy margins, you know, they, you can see along the edge, it's this, this kind of wavy, rounded, blunt leaves. Um, it's pretty easy to identify. Um, but I guess it does have little flowers on occasion, but they're hard to see. Um, it's pretty big, it grows to five meters. It's a pretty big plant, but it's pretty easy to identify. But it is a real problem, at least down here and in the Midwest. Curly, curly leaf pondweed is getting harder and harder to deal with. Eurasian milfoil, everybody's heard of this probably. Uh, back to the first video when Patty described it, the key features here are this, this reddish brown stem, that's a giveaway. And then these, <clears throat> I'm gonna show you in a minute, these uh, little leaves are divided into these little tiny, tiny, tiny leaflets. I told you about that. Um, so you've got four leaves and whorls around the stem, and each one's made up with at least a dozen opposite little leaflets. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's blunt. It looks kind of like these were cut off, almost not square, but kind of cut off. Whereas if you compare it to common coontail, these are it's a little pointier, a little feathery, you know, more pointier, um, bristly. Uh, going back again, oh, this is see how bright green. There's none of that red. Uh, dark red or brown that you see in Eurasian milfoil. And sometimes along the edges of the plant, it seems redder, the milfoil is red as well. This stuff grows in really thick beds. We've been dealing with it here in New York State for know, at least 30 years harvesting this stuff. Unfortunately, it's hybridizing with common northern milfoil, uh, so, which isn't good. Uh, so we'll see what happens to the core northern milfoil populations that are just gonna end up being hybridized completely by this stuff. What coontail does look like a raccoon's tail. It's in, and this is very, you can very large beds of this, uh, but it's a healthy native species. Hydrilla. Hydrilla is like a number one wanted list here in New York State uh, because if it does get established, it, it takes over very quickly. Um, and, and we're out in front of this one for the most part. Um, there's, there's not too many infestations of this. The key thing to this, though, with identifying is it looks very much like Elodea that we looked at in the first video, very, very close to Elodea. But the key thing here is remember the serrated leaves? I drill it, you can look close and maybe use a little hand lens we gave you, but there's these little serrated leaves and that's how you identify it's hydrilla. And also, again, they have these little tubers, like little potato-like things in the sediment. There's the one on the hand here, and that's how they spread. So those are the two key things that tell a hydrilla from something else. Water chestnut, uh, this one's awful. If it takes over a pond or an inlet or a, a little bay, 
uh, the lake, it just takes over. It's just a solid mat of this stuff. It's, it's, a, it's floating. It makes these rosettes. These, uh, it's kind of neat looking plant. It's all these, these rosettes. There's somebody holding a rosette in each hand of all these leaves, a triangle of serrated edge leaves. It just makes this huge mat so the stuff can take right over. Um, it does have these little tiny flowers on occasion. Again, I talked about these, these uh, the seeds. If you see these seeds, they're, they're really they're neat, but they're really sharp. And they, they scientists think they, they uh, uh, stick in a waterfowl um, feathers and animals fur, and that's one way it helps transport these things. Um, so the, this is a real problem. The only good news is that there is some, and we've had some success in programs at our office of actually eradicating uh, chestnut and some embayments and things by getting an army of, a small army of volunteers with kayaks and waders and going out and actually hand pulling the stuff over, say, three seasons. And it, then it knocks down the population every year and then ultimately it's virtually gone. Um, so this one is somewhat controllable. It takes a lot of human effort, but it's doable. Another really healthy one, eelgrass. Um, apparently fish eat this. It's a, it's, it looks just like it's a native. It looks just like grass, a field of grass under the water. Pretty easy to identify and it's, it shows a healthy ecosystem. I guess a lot of, a lot of fish eat it. Um, I guess if you look closely, it's kind of ribbon-like with a it says narrow strip up the center here. And then duckweed. Duckweed is just kind of fun because it, it's these little tiny things, look like little tiny micro micro water lilies here just growing with some water lilies it's a native uh some people see it initially and think oh no it's a it's some kind of algae bloom but it's not and then if you really get into this stuff and excited about identifying duckweed it's can be confused with greater duckweed <laughs> which is purple or red on it and underneath it's purple or red on, on it in a spot and this is more green on top of the yellow underneath but duckweed is another kind of interesting plant so we're almost done here, folks. Again, here's the resources. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, I'm going to show you this document in just a sec. There's a link. There's a, a, a document here with a link to other things. The videos I showed, um, my contact information, the information of uh, the digital version of the, the field guide we sent up, et cetera. Um, there's other documents, a collaborative overview. There's kind of a mission statement we did of why we're doing this, the instructions for the survey one, two, three. So let me, if I can here, hang on. Uh, okay, so here it is. So let me, wait, let me sort it. So up here we have fact sheets. I did, uh, I collected a bunch of fact sheets, including one we did for Starry Stonewort. And then there's like a couple for each of these other invasives in here. You can use those as resources to look at, help learn. Um, I pulled the fact sheets from various places around uh, different states and things. Um, I found that fact sheets are talking about the same thing, but different people use different diagrams or pictures or describe it differently. And look at multiple fact sheets to me actually helps you understand better uh, what they are and how to identify them. Um, mission statement, all these things I told you about, a little bit about the collaborative, you can pass these along to anybody. Um, overview of the survey program, what we just talked about. This one, number, again, number five, we had a slide of this before, this is kind of quick instructions about how to access and use survey one, two, three. This here, if you can see it right in the middle, that is the cryptic little URL. If you open this up in your phone or your tablet and go to that URL, you get walk through how to install survey one two three and access the for the form. Um, this is a guide, another guide for plant ID and surveillance in New York State. This was a private uh, uh, con contract and consulting firm did another little uh, booklet. We have a draft of that. We can give you powerful algal blooms. So everybody should know about that. Um, the data sheet, if, this is if, you, if you're not comfortable using Survey123, there's a data sheet you can use to hand, hand fill out what you're finding. Um, this is the actual PDF of what you just saw. Okay, so that's the actual presentation I just gave you. And number, goal number 10, if you pass this on to somebody, they can get back to this folder full of information. Um, this is a link, uh, again, and a different location to the actual PDF, so you can get to it a couple different places. This is up on our website. Um, 
a video of this. I will post a video of this um, presentation up here. You can find it through our website. Um, you can find it on the Starry Stonewort Collaborative Facebook, uh, sorry, YouTube channel as well, but you can get through it directly through here. Um, and then these, these are two locations on our website, the Finger Lakes um, Prism website. A one is a bunch of fact sheets. We got a whole book full of fact sheets we did that you can download individually and, and print. And there's more other information, identification information up there. And this is the digital version of the little uh, guide we included in the kits we sent up. Again, you can look at that. There's, other, there's also other links up there. If you just want to take a picture of the camera and send us a picture for identification, you can do that too. There's, uh, although you're going to probably do that with Survey123, but uh, you can send it to us here. And this is my contact information at the bottom. Uh, it's my email, phone number. I'll get that with the COVID situation. This is, you leave a message and it gets forwarded to me, but I'll get it. And then this is my mailing address at the college if, when you send in the voucher samples. And so that's your, this, this is where a lot of information here for you to use. And I think I'm just about done, folks. So yes, um, think of your questions. I'm gonna send a little, if this works, a little Zoom poll with four questions to you. If you would please do real simple. Um, question three is kind of dependent on what you said in question two, but please, there's an option that says, um, for number three, it said none of the above. Uh, please, if that's, if that's the case, you gotta put something for number three, that's what I'm saying. I know it's a little confusing, but you can put something for number three or else the Zoom will not let the sample, let the uh, poll be uh, submitted. So if you could all fill this out quickly for me, I'd really appreciate it. And think of any questions you've got and submit those uh, by the chat box. Amanda, do you have anything to add? Did I miss something? No, that was, I think that you covered everything uh, really well. We do have a few comments and questions in the chat box. So I'll just wait till everybody's added their okay. and then I can let you know. Wonderful. <clears throat> oh, this is great. This once I learned, of course, how to do this properly through Zoom, <laughs> it works pretty well. Yeah. But for matter of fact, I learned from the one I did for, I didn't do it right. They, a lot of people, you know, question three says, if no, and I hadn't put none of the above yet, and said, I can't submit, <laughs> right. I can't submit the, the, the form, you know, it's because right. well, you've got to put something in three. So it's just a learning curve with all these tools yeah. that Zoom has. But it works well. You can, it, you can get the results and it downloads it for you. You can put it into a spreadsheet or whatever. While the um, last few votes are coming in here, I will just say that Kyle uh, from Ducks Unlimited made a comment that Paul Skowinski has a good field guide with photos as well called Aquatic Plants of the Upper Midwest, a photograph yeah field guide to our underwater forest. So he said that's worth having that on hand. Yep. And that's, that's the book he wrote. It's excellent. I saw, I was able to see him about a year ago. I met him in person. I went to a conference out that way and he was out of print of them. I don't know where he stands with that at this point. Um, I'm, but you can try and contact him and see, or I can try and contact for the group and see, but yes, he's, it's an excellent book. He did a great job on it. Okay, I think we've got most of the people polled that are going to poll. A couple more seconds, folks. Anybody who's going to answer my poll here or respond to it? I guess you respond to a poll. Okay, going, going, gone. I'm going to stop the poll. Okay, thank you everybody for that. Okay, any other questions? So we did have uh, from 
Christine, and Christine is with uh, Quinty Conservation Authority, and uh, she said that they've had a coastal wetland monitoring program in the Bay of Quinty on Lake Ontario uh, since 2006, and right. they have starry stonewort in most, if not all, of their coastal wetlands that they monitor. Um, they had been IDing it as Nitella, but since since 2016, when they became aware that it was actually uh, starry stonewort. So on that observed location map you previously showed, it didn't actually include any points in the Bay of Quinty. And she was just asking if you had been in touch with the Canadian Wildlife Services, because apparently, and I did not know this, they should have an intensive data set. The Canadian Wildlife Service? Yeah. No, I have not. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, well then, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I can <laughs> to uh, connect. Yeah, I had heard from, I think, again, Brian, Brian Ginn over at the, um, Lake Simcoe that right. um, it had been misidentified for, I mean, way back, it was misidentified for years, um, mm -hmm. back in the 60s and before, but thank you. I will, I'll check that out. And then uh, Ali had a question here about the rake toss. So how far do you uh, throw the rake and uh, do you want your three locations to be in a straight transect if possible, or does it not matter? Um, throw it wherever you're comfortable. You know, you want to throw it out away from you a little bit. You know, you've got, I don't, I can't remember, you know, the, the video said 100 feet of rope. I don't think it's that much, but there's at least 30 to 50 feet of rope there. So um, just toss it out as far as you can conveniently. You know, when you're in a kayak, it gets a little interesting trying to throw a rake. It takes a little coordination. Um, so just out away from you so you can, as you draw it back to you, it's got a chance to catch some stuff, okay? Um, so you don't have to like throw it to the end or, you know, whatever, just a good convenient throw in your location. Um, second, what was, I'm sorry, what was the second question? <laughs> Did you say? Uh, I think just that, how far do you throw it and do you want your three locations to oh. be in a straight transect? Or they, they do not have to be in a transect. You're getting into, you know, the, Rake tosses are an art and a science, but they are still the the uh, most common accepted way to take to take samples of, of aquatic plants. And scientists, maybe you guys, some of you have done this. They set up a point intercept survey where they set up a very detailed grid, and they go out and where every grid intersection they throw the rake at least three times and record everything, take averages, move to the next point, and all that. That's not the that's not the uh, point for doing this is not the reason for doing this. If you want to do it in a straight transit, you can, but it's not necessary. We're just trying to get, you know, folks out there learning how to do this, appreciating the need to understand invasive species and, and uh, you know, maybe, you know, if they find something new that it can get recorded in, in early detection. So no, you don't have to do a transect. If it's easier for you, go ahead, um, but it certainly doesn't have to be. Okay, and then another just comment here, just Christine following up. Uh, just to let you know that the that uh, Canadian Wildlife Services is a division of Environment Canada, which is a department of the government of Canada. Just in case you had any issues finding um, finding that. Okay, thank you again. I'm writing more notes. <laughs> um, and I had a, a couple of questions uh, as well, David. So. Okay. Um, is there any, is there a project or anything on iNaturalist for Starry Stonewort? On iNaturalist, which one is that? Help me out. Uh, so, so it's a, an app where you can um, take photos and um, report what species you see where. Um, the name? It helps with uh, identification of species based on the, on yes, the, it, it, the sort of citizen it, science based app as well. Yep, there may be. Um, okay. I would doubt if there is. The reason, and, and this has been an issue going through the whole thing, the reason we went with the USGS, I mean, went with our own form, basically, went with a generic form that isn't part of another program, because like the, you've probably seen uh, EDD maps as well. It's a big yeah. program they have. Yeah, they're all, they're all great. They're all good. And some states have their own even um, down here. Uh, but we went with a generic one because we were dealing with in this collaborative, we're dealing with um, a vast area that in, in literally encompasses parts of two countries and a whole bunch of different states um, in, 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 in the U.S. here. So we pick one that we, something nobody's using. So it's, it's a, a general tool that all can use. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
and it's actually caused a little bit of confusion here in New York State because we have a very, a very, very strong program of IMAP invasives here in New York State, a different program. Um, so the design naturalist, I haven't looked in a while, it may, although I have heard from others in Canada that um, there's not much out there about reporting starry stonewort and its, and its importance on the front burner, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard that, and I know, again, Brian Ginn, he's talked to um, some folks, I, boy, I, I think it's Ontario, there, there's an Ontario Invasive Species Organization at the yeah. government level, and he's talked to them a couple times, and they still haven't added Starry Stonewall to the list. Um, so anyway, I, we're trying not to confuse things, but this is the reason we developed our own form, was because it would be, be used by all and not and be unique to everybody. But again, we will update, you know, we will provide the data to anybody who wants it. You know, USGS is our first pick because again, they're nationwide US and also great, they're fine with Canadian data as well. And so it's, you know, all encompassing, but we'll supply it to anybody who needs it. Okay, that's great. And then also when you are doing the actual rake toss and let's say you pull up a rake and it has all kinds of starry stonewort in it. What do you do with the bulk of that starry stonewort after? Are you going to like dispose of it or do you just toss everything back into the water? How does that work? Good one. Good one. If you can, you want to dispose of it properly. Now, the problem is if you're out, uh, you know, you're out in a kayak in a windy day trying to throw it, there's not a lot of storage space um, in the kayak. Although if you're only doing you know, a few, three rake tosses, you can probably have space to bring it in. The, but yeah, the best thing to do is to, you know, proper disposal location, an upland disposal location will, will uh, get back in the water because you are obviously creating fragments when you tear a bunch of starry stone off on your rake. Um, so yes, if you can dispose of it land site in the proper disposal, in the trash even, because um, the stuff breaks down quickly into almost nothing. You let it dry out, it turns into hardly anything, but it needs to be out of the water. So good question, good comment. Um, yeah, ideally don't throw it back in the water unless you really have to. Okay, great. Did anybody else have uh, any questions while we still have David here? Okay. All right. Well, that was, that was excellent, David. Um, I learned a lot today and well. you talking about Starry Stonewort for a while and it's exciting uh, that we have, um, we are involved with the collaborative now and also thanks again for passing along those um, rake toss kits and so I do have five of them with me and I'm going to um, distribute those to some of our partners that were on the call today and also uh, to various offices within NCC that are interested in, in doing this sampling. Uh, so. Um, I will follow up with everybody about that uh, next week. And, and I thank everybody for sitting through this. It's a lot of information I kind of burned through quickly, but um, you know, if you're gonna get involved in doing, you know, for the rest of the summer, doing a survey every other week or when you can, um, please, you know, let Amanda know so she can let me know or let me know who's doing it, what groups, you know, if, if there's you know, four or five of you in a group, um, you know, maybe pick one person as a contact. <laughs> just make it easier. But let me know when you're going out and uh, and, I'll, and, and again, I will start contacting you, Amanda, if you can forward everybody's contact information and I'll try and send you emails every other week too. And, you know, just trying to keep the communication open, keep people going, see what they need, if anything, and questions, problems, all that good stuff. Sure, absolutely. So again, thank you everybody. This was great. Appreciate it. Awesome, thanks so much, David. Okay, we'll be in touch. Yeah, for sure. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.